thank you everyone for uh, attending here for the time. Uh, good morning, yeah, bon dia. So the idea here is that we talk and I share some ideas about uh, installing, like auto installing the BSD systems uh, that I use it uh, from time to time. And it's not a tutorial session. It uh, is not a, a session that will be like uh, giving you like a copy paste uh, ready to go uh, material. The, the, the main concern that I have here is that you can get the information and get uh, ideas or ways of uh, doing it uh, yourself. Um, yeah, basically that's it. We are not like using any kind of um, extra API or uh, one click button to uh, give us or deploy uh, magically um, a system uh, that you want to have, but um, that you will understand how things work behind the scenes and you can implement it in yourself using either a Dragonfly BSD, FreeBSD, NetBSD or OpenBSD for uh, any kind of uh, setup that you want to have. So um, I'm Vinicius, I'm a FreeBSD ports committer and I'm also part of the Tor project. I'm a core team member of the Tor project and I'm doing like um, mostly uh, the PAT, privacy enhancement technology um, uh, work for Tor and merging uh, as much as we can into the BSD systems like uh, mostly the FreeBSD, but we also have stuff on the open and NetBSD. And that's me, like, uh, what can I say? I also was part of other BSD conferences. Uh, in the past, I presented um, BSD, uh, FreeBSD robot uh, with a friend of mine, uh, Eddie Kahle. And BSD Can, we also uh, have an um, episode on BSD now. Uh, you can um, take a time uh, later and watch it um, if you want to. And that's it. So let's jump to our uh, agenda for today. Um, as you can see, like a Python fan, like we have the init. Um, I'm going to talk about a bit, a bit of uh, avoiding flamey wars um, during the presentation. That is something that I think that is uh, unhealthy and is not the purpose here for this presentation. And I will also uh, tell uh, about the motivation that I have uh, for writing this uh, presentation. We are gonna do, jump uh, quickly into a uh, reverse ARP, OOTP, DCP. We're gonna talk about uh, SysLinux, uh, mention very quick about U-Boot, uh, then we have a look into FTP, TFTP, HTTP. Yeah, that gives us a way to, to like uh, fetch the live system image or any kind of um, displays uh, setup that we want to have. Then we jump into the iPixie uh, project. And I will mention like this uh, two projects that use uh, iPixie on behind the scenes for them. Finally, we get to the installers. And here we have like the auto installers because our idea is to not, uh, let's say, waste uh, time by sitting in front of the computer. That is actually the main purpose of uh, this presentation that we can automate as much as we can to like deployment, not even, uh, not only uh, virtual machines, but also uh, bare metal machines. Yeah? Uh, if that was not uh, clear in the beginning, but yeah, you can do it uh, not only on VMs, uh, you can also like do this whole thing for uh, physical machines. Uh, yeah, so we get uh, here the, the, the main uh, BSDs that I would say, uh, Dragonfly, FreeBSD, NetBSD and OpenBSD. Uh, and at the end, I will talk, uh, I will have like a few words about Puppet. That is uh, the way that I use it uh, <clears throat> to, uh, 
to build the automated part um, for it. So, um, really like it. There is the init tutorial. So avoiding the, the, the flame here is um, very important because most people say that, oh, I can do uh, better stuff with a Kickstarter file, with a pre-seed file, or I can just use DD and that saves me time. I can like do like a dump restore and then that's, that's good, good for you. Um, as I said before, it's not the purpose here of uh, getting into a battle of this solution is better or um, than what you're presenting. You're presenting something that is uh, unusual, poor design, or whatever. That's your opinion. I just, as I said, sharing thoughts, sharing ideas that you can use to build your bridge, to build your infrastructure. And that is, again, I repeat myself again, the main purpose of this presentation. If you want to use uh, Packer, Preseed File, Kickstarter, DD, uh, Cloud Config stuff and say that's better and good for you. But yeah, that's it. And yeah, the motivation um, using like a CD pub more beer, uh, not just because uh, we want to hang out with friends uh, and have a beer in a pub, but also I believe that the most important stuff that we can do in our life is not like sitting in front of a laptop or sitting in front of a computer and like uh, waste time installing a machine, configuring some tweaks here and there, hardening the system and yeah. So we use the technologies and the softwares, the projects that we have to do it for us so we can take care of our family, we can enjoy time with our friends, we can follow the sun, we can go to the beach, we can go to the park and whatever. You can enjoy like a hobbies, playing sports, taking care of like uh, plants, gardens uh, and this kind of stuff. Also, of course, this uh, is part of hobbies. You can also do like other uh, open source projects. So here we jump into the uh, reverse ARP uh, boot uh, P with the bootstrap protocol and BCP. Yeah. That will be like the, the, the kickstart for uh, everything that we uh, have when we boot like a, a client machine. So this uh, demons for the reverse ARP, for the uh, bootstrap protocol and the DCP will run in a server and this server will be prepared to, to provide client machines they can be like virtual machines or virtual machine uh, or physical machines that will uh, boot a live system. Yeah? And, and these days we have like a disk class uh, setup for client machines, like uh, machines that really do not have a hard drive or even machines that have the hard drive, but they boot a live system and do any kind of special uh, setup using these physical disks that uh, not um, mainly run the operating system itself. They will just be used uh, as a uh, storage for some reason or yeah, whatever. So the reverse ARP, the bootstrap protocol and the dynamic host configuration protocol are provided us like they are here sorted in kind of a historical way or um, poor feature way to the more um, fancy and elaborated uh, features that we can get. Like the reverse address uh, resolution protocol did not uh, give us uh, like a DNS server, a gateway, and we needed to manually configure like a MAC address table that we will put like the, this MAC address is part of this, uh, we'll get um, this IP address to this machine and this machine with a different MAC address will give this other uh, IP address and that's the way that uh, the things work because in the past like it was like I don't know like 80s or something uh, this was the the way that it goes so uh, bootstrap uh, protocol the boot peak came up 
and could give us the DNS uh, gateways. It also gives us the IP address of the, the server that will be used to provide us via like uh, TFTP. We are going to talk uh, a bit later about it. The, the image that we are going to, to boot. No? And it also needed like a pre-configuration. So we mainly needed to go there and say that like, this machine will get this IP address and this stuff, this DNS and gateway. And now we reach like the, the times that we use the, the DACP. Uh, the DACP also like have the, the same features that we got from the uh, bootstrap protocol. It gives us like a DNS, gives us the gated, but it also gives us like a way to put a full qualifier domain name into the clients, uh, the client machines. Uh, we can like put the NTP servers uh, to be used in this uh, particular network uh, in a way that we don't really need to configure every single machine um, that's going to use a configuration that, that that's like, a, it's dynamic. Yeah? And if we use like uh, IPv6, we can also do this, but it will be like a TCP v6. It's a bit different from the TCP before if we like use uh, to be comparing the uh, RFCs, but we can actually say that's this same thing. It's 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 the same thing. For for this purpose, we can we can say that's the same thing. It provides the um, yeah the main NTP servers and yeah. of course for for v6 we also have like a router advertisement, but that's another thing. It's not important here for us. So the Sys Linux. Sys Linux is a lightweight bootloader. The bootloader is a thing that will, um, it kind of got um, replaced uh, this idea of uh, having a BIOS and finding in the hard drive an operating system that will boot for us. No? So Sys Linux is a lightweight bootloader that we can like put in a floppy disk, we can use to bootstrap uh, operating systems from uh, FAT uh, file system from XT2, XT3, XT4, yeah. And it's a um, bootloader. Uh, it's a project that also has uh, small nuances, uh, different uh, binaries that will work for different purposes. Here, we are going to focus more in the Pixel Linux, which is like the uh, pre-boot execution environment that we get to boot the live image. No? The SysLinux also has a way to boot ISO images. It also has a way to like chain loading or uh, other uh, binaries. Uh, like here I put like the, the main disk uh, images. And basically that's it. And like for, for the purpose here, we just need to know that SysLinux is going to help us, it helped me to boot the diskless setup for the system that I use it to get a way for auto installing themselves. And U boot. U boot, a lot of people kind of uh, confuse it that is a module for SysLinux, but it's not SysLinux. It's mostly used for uh, embedded systems, for um, ARM in this case. And different from SysLinux, it's um, kind of a first stage. Uh, bootloader. You don't um, really need to like to have something before it to load it and it will be like the bootloader in the first stage that don't um, don't have, how can I say that, um, extra helpers to load the operating system itself in like this uh, embedded system running in an um, ARM system. And yeah, the main thing that's we kind of say here is it's not SysLinux. So now that we have uh, talked about the protocols that kind of bootstraps the client machines information, like IP address, the, 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 the ID of the, the server that we're going to use for fetching the image, so we get the DNS and stuff, we get into the, the protocols that we're going to use to fetch 
to download or load the images for us. So uh, the SysLinux that we mentioned before can use uh, all these uh, three protocols um, to download the image that we're going to use for booting the, the, the system. The, here, as you can see, it's just like pinpointing uh, stuff. I'm not a fan of writing like uh, long uh, texts in the slides. So you can use like to get like information and maybe go into the search engine of your preference and uh, look for more information about this. So the differences here that I show is the TF, uh, TFTP, is the, the second one listed here, uh, doesn't, um, does not offer us a way of doing authentication and encryption. It has this uh, limitation, let's say, of the file size that we're going to uh, transfer on the network and also uh, doesn't uh, provide a way for most cases that we going to use we are all um, doesn't provide a way for us in most cases that we can download this image from a remote site across let's say continents from the internet or so we basically most usually in land you know very very specific way, like a DMZ or something like that. Different from the FTP and the HTTP protocols that we can like use automation and encryption. Um, for this case, we don't um, confuse the SFTP with the FTPS. They are different things. Uh, I just mentioned that the, the, the RFC for the FTPS and the ports that it uses. The SFTP, it's going to work together with the SSE D, uh, daemon. Uh, it has, uh, it's not FTP, uh, as, as you can see. And finally, uh, I would like to mention the HTTP uh, protocol that offers the way that we can use authentication and encryption yeah, together with the TLS. Um, also just mention for information that uh, runs on TCP for free. And I added a pinpoint that you can combine it uh, it with uh, HA proxy in a way that we like add some special failover setup if we going to I don't know if you have like a special setup that can not go down and must rely on uh, failover or load balancing of this. Uh, kind of infrastructure that I need to build. And uh, yeah, we can combine uh, AJ proxy to use uh, HTTP and get that into like a CDN for your company or for your purposes that you could not do like, let's say with the TFTP. If you guys have any question, just uh, Put in the chat, or we try to have a look here in the chat notes. That's uh, all fine. Uh, don't be shy. So, iPixie, the iPixie project. That is a fun thing about um, it's on the FAQ about the iPixie. The I stands for nothing special. Yeah. Anyway. So the iPixie is a full Pixie uh, implementation. The, the Pixie here is the uh, pre-boot uh, environment that we're going to use. And the main pinpoints here that I uh, want to show you and uh, share with you is that it can use uh, ATP, ATPS. No? It can uh, load um, images from ATPS. It supports uh, IPv6. You can also load um, boot uh, images from iSCSI and fiber channel over internet and a very nice feature of uh, iPixie is that you can uh, make it um, let's say looking here for the um, chain loading we see like they uh, wrote scripting so you can put the scripting logic to work for us in a way that uh, it sets up um, particular VLAN that is going to join this client, this specific client machine that booted into the VLAN that will serve only, let's say, DNS traffic. So it, 
this machine that got uh, booted will be joined automatically based on this scripting logic, uh, DNS VLAN or the NTP VLAN or the web service VLAN. And we can use the IPXC uh, scripting to do this. Yeah? It doesn't mean that you're going to have uh, machines that you put like in a hack or in the basement and you need to manually uh, change a lot of configurations um, to say, oh, this machine will boot for my purpose of web server and this will boot the purpose for NTP service or whatever. You can add this logic into a, let's say, PHP script or something like this. And uh, IPixie provides a way that this um, VLAN will be configured directly before you boot the operating system. Right. Yeah. Different from the SysLinux uh, project, you can kind of flash an image, uh, an expansion run with IPixie, and put it like, let's say, in uh, a network card of your preference. I listed here like the uh, models, uh, Broadcom, Intel, and it also has a way that you um, use it together with uh, VMware. Uh, IPXC can also uh, boot uh, ISO images, and yeah, that's an um, interesting part for us. is more like the, the VLAN setup, uh, HTTP, and V6 support. <coughs> this is one of the projects that I share with you that uses uh, IPXC. It's the all-in-one bootable software, AIO. And this uh, link will send you to their uh, website with instructions about how you can use it uh, to boot uh, FreeBSD. And this is uh, how the I.O. looks like. It gives like different uh, options to like, boot different systems from the network. We don't even need to, you know, uh, waste time doing ourselves the multi-boot uh, ISO image or USB stick. Similar to what we get from Netboot uh, XYZ. Uh, there is a GitHub page of the project. You have the, the templates and the menu that offers us a way to boot uh, FreeBSD and OpenBSD. You can actually uh, use this uh, as a hint or as a source for your testing uh, purposes uh, later, if you want to uh, play it a little bit after the, the talk, that will be cool. You can get the, the, the templates for, uh, to use with IPXE to boot like your FreeBSD, OpenBSD, or any system that you would like to try booting in all This is how uh, it looks like. You can see there like installers, Linux installers, BSD installers, Windows installers. Let's say you want to boot uh, CentOS, you want to boot uh, OpenSUSE or whatever. And you can just you can just boot it. Let's say you chose Debian and go get the ISO image from, from the Debian, the netboot part uh, of it and boot your system. You don't even need to, to kind of download the image and point it to a CD or whatever, you can just use uh, that boot uh, XYZ and boot these different systems. <coughs> so, we reached the Installers. Here we talk about like the uh, four main BSD systems, and they are installers. For us, in this case, auto installers. So, how did I manage to auto install uh, Dragonfly BSD on a client machine? I uh, got its uh, CD or uh, MG, like um, DD uh, image, let's say and kind of booted it manually. I saw that it uh, offers us a way 
to install it with a fancy uh, internet installer. But for me, as I wanted to auto install it, I jump it into a disk class setup. So it offers us the, the Pixie Boot or the Pixie Boot TFTP. Um, those uh, are the, um, let's say, the bootstrap folders that we can use. I choose to use the NFS uh, version of uh, the Pixie Boot. And after setting uh, an environment to boot the Dragonfly uh, BSD based actually on its ISO image, yeah, I kind of I got the ISO image, uh, mounted it into um, a file system, changed it like a very few um, configurations like to the rc.conf, um, sorry, the, the loader.conf that um, specify that we are booting from an ISO image. So I changed it to say that we are not booting from an ISO image and yeah, added uh, a line on the etc rc.local. What did I add it into the rc.local? We can see on the next slide. Um, I was playing with these two possibilities. So they have the PFI, is the pre-flight installer that we uh, can add uh, informations for auto installing the system in the media that we boot. It gives us like a um, backend and gives us a way to run um, a commons, a binary or a script before um, uh, jumping into the installer itself. Um, I discovered a very interesting thing that they had in the past a CGI, uh, like a, a, a web server that we could use to install the system. That's really interesting. But it did not serve for my purpose. Uh, so um, yeah, just uh, sharing here with you. The PFI uh, offers its defaults under uh, etc defaults uh, pfi.conf. So you move that file and change uh, what you need to change. Um, and make it uh, on etc uh, pfi.conf. It works in the same way that we work with uh, rc.conf. So you can say like a uh, uh, AF config interface, whatever, um, do the DCP thing, um, put the disks, uh, this and that, and we can have the, the, the pfi to work uh, for us. But that I have like a for every for every image that I needed to boot, I discover a way to get the the thing for me to work well, work better when I use the R config, it's the remote configuration client server that uh, Dragonfly Dragonfly BSD has. It's really cool, really really interesting. We just uh, need a server running with the R config daemon. Uh, that was in a Dragonfly PSD machine. And we have uh, different, uh, let's say, flavors of uh, getting us an automated setup, like an auto installation with an encrypted root with HamaFS, and you just need to adjust uh, to your uh, purpose. So you have the server running the R config and the client machines booted. And that was the, the, the configuration that I changed in the rc.local. So you just broadcast that, hey, I'm a Dragonfly BSD, do you have something for me? So if you have something for me, I will auto install myself uh, based on the configuration that you offer. So that worked really, really, really well. If you want to not um, use a Dragonfly BSD running the R config, you can kind of um, copy paste that logic from their examples and put it everything under the rc.local if you want to. <coughs> there is this uh, one uh, ticket. Uh, open on the Dragonfly uh, Redmine that mentioned the, the 
the way that we can like uh, enable headless install if you want to check it uh, for more information maybe a patch that you want to test or something you can use this link description so the FreeBSD one I again use it the disk less setup yeah? and we we booted uh, FreeBSD like a diskless system. The machine has, of course, for my for my case, uh, a hard drive, and it booted from the, the network. The, the image of a FreeBSD that I, that I chose to use as was uh, thirteen uh, not old release and was uh, pretty easy actually to to auto install it because uh, I use the BSD install with uh, a script that is uh, does actually everything for us um, that that's actually one of the motivations uh, that I have for uh, writing this uh, this talk because most people say that ah, I can uh, auto install CentOS I can auto install Debian but FreeBSD doesn't provide us a way to uh, auto install it but it did like for a long time the, the other BSD systems uh, did it as well. Uh, anyway, I use it the uh, scripting uh, thing that we can use with the uh, FreeBSD, uh, the BSD install. Uh, it's divided into um, two parts, the preamble and the uh, setup. The preamble would be like uh, you set your variables and the uh, setup is like uh, the, the script itself that runs into this uh, Siege root uh, environment on the installed system. So again, I use the diskless uh, setup to boot the machine. Got the um, NFSD running, put it the uh, uh, exports, uh, configured it, uh, did the DNS thing, configured it here and there. Uh, Pixie booted it using its uh, own uh, Pixie boot, like uh, the loader that uh, it has and use the uh, BSD install. That's basically it. Uh, BSD install uses the BSD config. Um, if people don't uh, heard about uh, BSD config uh, yet, it's used like a behind the scenes that uh, you can like, add the default router, you can configure your uh, time zone. Like if you go to the, if you have any free BSD machine running or test machine or whatever, you just type a uh, BSD config uh, space like a time zone and you can change the time zone is a way that you can do it uh, graphically in a way that it's comfortable for more most people this is how the script looks like yeah, for us we have like a BSD install uh, this site for you, let's say, living in uh, Chile, you can choose a uh, mirror close to your location. Or if you're living in another country, you choose a different mirror. Or you create uh, your own. You can also add uh, custom variables and um, Uh, put some values here, values there, and use it later into the um, script itself. Um, that goes um, after the, the, the shebang that you see. This is actually one file, it's one single file. Yeah? The, the BSD install uh, will treat, will work this out to see that the first part is the preamble and the second part is the um, setup script no? you don't need to like have two different files uh, when we think about it the, the shebang that is there like the uh, being uh, sh this is actually one file no? so you just uh, add your logics here there is at your host name you can like uh, re run the FreeBSD update, um, you can bootstrap the PKG, you can install uh, packages, you can make some changes to use, let's say, the NTP servers. Yeah? Let's say that you're uh, living uh, in Brazil right now, 
you can go to uh, ntp.br and get their um, uh, service. So you work it out and uh, put the ntp.br uh, service there into your uh, ntp.conf after installing everything and just reboot the machine. When I uh, first started to get stuff like Rio, when I was uh, preparing for this presentation, I kind of got uh, a bit stuck uh, and uh, filed this uh, bug on Bugzilla about um, auto installing the, the FreeBSD. Uh, so it was working for me. I was happy with it uh, a lot. But I, I just decided that other people could maybe get some benefits of it. And I filed a bug, I proposed the patches, and it got fixed. And thank you for everyone that helped to get this fixed. It now gives us a way to uh, auto-install with, uh, with a nice script. And we can just boot a machine and grab a coffee, sit on the deck, and enjoy the song. This is also a very interesting reading that I would share with you. It's about uh, MFSBSD from Martin. It's on GitHub. Martin is also a FreeBSD uh, committer. And I really recommend you to have a couple of minutes and read this um, about the MFSBSD. Let's see, one second. Share notes. Questions. Okay. So we reached the NetBSD installer. The NetBSD installer for me was really interesting because um, as far as I read it, uh, man pages here and there, uh, a way to auto install it, I couldn't really find a way. But I got into its uh, utility menu, login functions, and enable it. At the end of my setup, I got these uh, two files under the TMP uh, folder. So I kind of uh, steal it from the installer system, put it in the server that will be like my, uh, let's say, the TXE server, the TFTP server, that will be like the, the, the main machine that will uh, provide uh, us a way to boot the, the system and have the, the, the disk class machine to be uh, ready for us. So I just needed to work at a very few lines of this uh, sysinst.sh and I was able to like totally destroy the, the virtual machine that I used uh, the first time, create a new one base it on its uh, login functions from the first install. The server booted a disk class system in this new machine. I check, like, I of course, for this uh, example, I updated the MAC address and say, OK, this MAC address will give me like this host name stuff, uh, very few changes that, 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 that you can figure it out. Uh, so the second machine that I booted was able to install itself. So I could get the uh, PKG in, I got uh, some packages in the installer, and then, well, that was it. It rebooted itself, and in the next boot, uh, the IPX uh, configuration that I used, uh, first tried to boot from, from the hard drive, it booted the, the fresh and new installed system. I also just, uh, as I mentioned before, I used it to uh, rely on the RC dot uh, local. And when I was researching a bit about all the installations, I found this very interesting project. That is the Anita, the automated NetBSD installation and test application that we can use to install not only uh, x86 boxes, we can also use it to install like ARM, um, yeah, as you see. But 
it's only used with uh, QMO and uh, GUN. Yeah, we cannot use Anita to, as far as I understood, I might be wrong. Uh, you cannot use uh, Anita to install a machine on the physical machine. Here is a talk about it from Martin. It's also from another EuroBSD con. You can definitely take time to read it later if you want to. And finally, we reach it the OpenBSD uh, installer. <coughs> To be honest, it was the easiest BSD that I used and was able to auto install itself. It was really straightforward. I just needed to name the the, the Pixie boot uh, loader correctly and it just auto installed it. It uh, boots, it checks for a file called install.conf or checks its hostname install.conf, uh, which Hostname is the hostname of the client machine, or MAC address with, will be the, the MAC address of this machine uh, install.conf and install itself. It was really straightforward. It just booted the bsd.rd, and that was it. Really, it was really, really easy. And here is how the install.conf looks like. Nothing pretty fancy. It's basically like the the questions that we got from the installer itself. There we can put their like HTTP server. We have a local machine in our network, so we don't uh, go to any CDN. We don't go to any uh, external uh, box to fetch uh, the 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 sets that we want to use. And it just auto installed everything for us. It also sets up a user if we want to, uh, gives us a way that we can just put the SSH uh, key of this user there, and that's it. Here you have the main triggers for me that motivated myself to write this talk. It's a talk from Misha and a talk from uh, Philip. Um, from the EuroBSDCon 2019. If you have time, just go to their links here and watch this, little fellas. While I was uh, researching a bit of the, how I could auto install OpenBSD, I also found this project, Fugu Ita, from Ishihiro uh, Kawamata. I hope it's uh, fine. Sorry if I pronounce it at, uh, wrong. Fugu means uh, blowfish in Japanese, and Ita uh, means uh, disk hard drive or something like that. Uh, it's a very interesting product. You can um, check it out if you want to later. So far so good. We are jumping into the final section, but I want to share something here with you. I believe I can, let's try this, because I have a recording here, and we enter the matrix. Can you all see the shared desktop? It's good? Working? Yes, yes. Are you getting getting in here? So here is the OpenBSD uh, <coughs> machine that is going to auto install itself. I'm gonna speed it a little bit because I'm also checking the time here. We are good but I don't want to take much time on this. I can actually skip a little bit. So it's booting from the network. I have this uh, system and this is the, the point that it just auto installs it as I, yeah. There's a little Easter egg here in this uh, auto install. 
I'm not sure if you guys are able to detect it. There's a small error. But yeah, it just boots itself, checks for uh, install.conf, uh, and easy going. I will just skip a very few seconds here. Yeah, got all the sets, installed itself, making all device nodes, relinking to create unique kernel. Skip a few seconds. Let's skip a little more. It is just a nice blue screen, not the blue screen of death. And we are booting a fresh installed system. <coughs> That's it, we have the sub butter up and running. So we got back to the presentation, right? Puppet. <clears throat> so I decided to use puppets. You can combine your wishes or needs to use a different to a different automation schema or whatever you want to. As I said before, our idea is not to get into battles, flame wars, or yeah, you know. I choose to use Puppet and that's it. That's what I'm sharing with you guys here. So Puppet needs uh, an agent to be running in the client machines. It will kind of has um, states defined for this machine. It will uh, say that uh, this machine has this and that and other configuration to be changed, to be um, updated or uh, whatever. This machine and that machine has this and this and this packages. This machine needs to run service A, B or M, whatever. And that's how Puppet Agent from the machine talks to the Puppet server and do its magic. The RTNK, sorry, uh, runs on the Puppet server. It gives us a way to have a dynamic environments. It's going to be set up in the server in a way that we have this thing called the control repository that gives us a way to have the dynamic environments. And here we need to set up it to use a version control system of our preference. I chose uh, Git, it worked pretty well. Let's say you have um, different uh, data centers or so different um, locations, offices, and you can like have different branches or you don't have different offers, don't have different data senses, but has different stages, let's say, the production, then development. You can test the development, uh, boot your machines, they are going to be um, auto-installed. After the reboot, they will be joining the development uh, environment and we will do your tests. And if it's all green, you can apply your logic and put some merge requests from the development uh, branch into the production branch. So you discuss with your team and see uh, if it's all green. So you just merge it and put the development in, into the production. So you are ready to go into production. Or you can combine it uh, the way you want to. Uh, that is really up to you. That uh, is just a feature that I'm um, sharing with you, uh, based on what Puppet offers us. And of course, that is a very um, 
interesting thing that we don't want to do is to put passwords into this Git repositories, like the plain text passwords. So I uh, offer you the possibility that you can use the YAML to uh, encrypt your plain text passwords. So uh, AYAML <coughs> uses the Hiera, the hierarchical database that you can use to define uh, groups or uh, specific uh, configurations. <coughs> that can be used in the Puppet manifests uh, with the lookup function in a way that you don't uh, really have uh, to expose uh, credentials, passwords, or uh, you can even uh, encrypt the whole block, the whole uh, manifest <coughs> yourself. Because it uses like a PKCS, you can have like a private key and a public key, it will be stored in the server. So you don't have uh, to be um, one exposing it all. Uh, on its manifest. This uh, encryption plugins can also be used if you want to. If it's mandatory, you can combine it with the P uh, GPG plugin to have multiple private keys. So if you have a team uh, that, uh, or if you have a policy that demands that nobody can share credentials or private keys, you add this uh, plugin and combine it in a way that everybody has its private key and you can also use the key management system from Google Cloud or AWS. You can also combine it with a HashiCorp uh, Vault. And this is how uh, Puppet Manifest looks like if you want to use it with uh, AML. As you see, you have the Vecinho Hosheda uh, plain text password being exposed here. But if you use uh, AML, you can have like a, maybe the same password nobody knows, uh, being used in a way that it's encrypted. We are reaching the end of the talk. I really wanted to share with you the, <coughs> the artworks from uh, Drachenmagia. You can really have uh, nice stuff from this artist. So share it out later. <coughs> Sorry. <coughs> And uh, to finish it, I will share with you the last video here, which is the... You can see it all, right? The version that has the iPixie floating uh, FreeBSC machine. I will also speed it up because I think we don't have much time. Yeah, we, we're actually keeping people from the lunch. So <laughs> we're, we're slightly over. <laughs> Sorry. So we skip, skip. Uh, yeah, this is the part where the auto installer just started to install itself. And skip, 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 skip. Yeah, it's doing its magic behind the scenes. Skip, skip, skip. There you see the, the puppet installed, the agent. Here we are uh, booting the machine again. And here we have the empalada. An extra user was set it up. And we check it if puppet agent is running. Already. It was actually done. And the change that we did was like the, as I talked before about the NTP change, I added like the Google and the uh, Observatorio Nacional uh, NTP server using Puppet, using iPixie, and using the FreeBSD uh, auto installer for this particular case. And that's it. Thank you very, very much for your time here. Thanks. Um...
I don't know if, uh, if people want questions or should we just let let, pe uh, let people go to the lunch? <laughs> uh, I don't see any questions in the chat. Yeah, here. I also don't see any questions here, and uh, also in the chat and the chat notes. But I will be here the whole day, so mm. uh, just hang out on uh, RC uh, special. I'm around. Yes, and there's, there's also the spatial dot chat, uh, which is for uh, for the whole way track. So uh, yeah, yeah. All right. All right. Uh, thank you very much for the talk, and um, uh, thanks for being at uh, your Eurobeast Econ. Here's hoping we can do this in in person next year. Yeah, that's really cool. <laughs> right. That's really cool. Um, thank you, Vanessa. Yeah.